Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's another Big Boys Table coming at you. Not live again. It's episode 50, though. The Big Five Zero. What's up, Mask? That's like uh, 13 above 37, I think. I think my first yeah. grader level of math is correct. Hey, I was born on the 13th, so. Oh, shit. That's like almost half of doubling it. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. So... Uh, we got a, a nice, juicy topic for you today, uh, filled with chicken. It's uh, RTS campaign design, so we're going to be talking about that. Uh, basically, lately, we've been uh, working on Hydra. Uh, obviously, we're, I'm always working on Hydra, but lately, I've been working on the actual missions, and right now, I'm just using the Melee AI with specified personalities and builds instead of it being randomly selected like it is in Melee for that game, and I'm trying to figure out what would be the closest relative or what would most closely resemble the actual uh, personality that, that will be at play in the campaign mission for the either the allies or the enemies. And doing so has made me realize that the um, kind of gameplay that you end up getting is uh, in some ways very similar to melee maps, but also in other ways very different. And that broached the topic in my mind, exactly how different should your RTS campaigns be from your RTS melee? And obviously there's like a, an immediate thing that comes to mind that, you know, how different should the tech trees be? How many campaign specific or faction specific units or changes should there be as far as the balance goes comp compared to whatever is accepted in, in the current melee balancing? Should you even have different uh, commits for that, for the game ba uh, balance? Should there be different changes at all or should it be consistent? And then of course you go into map specific differences and then maybe gimmick things like uh, what, what's the objective in this campaign mission? Is it is it significantly different than others? Is there some weird babysitting thing where you've got to defend a certain structure and if you lose it, it's game over? Or defend a hero and if you lose them, it's game over? Like, at what point are, is there something that's actually acceptable to deviate from the melee formula? And is the melee formula even really what you want to base your campaign around? Now, I think generally we'll have some pretty coincidental answers where both of us will say the same sort of thing to some of those questions. But I also think that there's going to be a large amount of uh, interesting perspective that each of us offers that, that will deviate from one another in terms of what our instincts are and maybe what our personal experiences have been when we're making maps. Because obviously, while you don't make RTS campaign maps anymore, you still are producing content for your D&D campaign. And presumably, there's a certain amount of disparity between what the players have experienced thus far and what they're going to experience in the future. So there's that element of uh, sort of deviation from the uh, known from the norm. And I suppose if you look back to the ARPG stuff that you were working on, I'd love to pick your brain about stuff like that because it's sort of similar in my head to an RTS. Like how different do you make each individual level? Is it that you introduce new enemies, which would be like the analog to introducing new personalities of, of enemy races or new units or you know new aspects of the tech tree as the campaign progresses? Or do you stick to the same set of enemies for the bestiary and you keep things relatively consistent in that respect but the environments are what you know offer some sort of distinction so th there's all sorts of different ways we can go with this but i figure out the first thing that we can do here is talk about uh just in an rts campaign context in your own experiences at, with rts campaign design how did you end up going about campaign specific design as opposed to melee you know we know that you did armageddon onslaught as a melee mod but did you end up when you were drafting campaigns for Armageddon Onslaught back when StarCraft II had some potential in theory, uh, or when you were drafting campaigns for Apex more recently, did you end up having situations where you deviated heavily from Melee or even minorly from Melee? And what were the contexts within which you made those decisions? Um, there are maps almost always started different. Like the first mission you start off in a melee situation with the whole bunker rush thing. We both start off with a CC and four units, but uh, the rest of the map was like partially populated. It just didn't really activate until after that was resolved. There was a lot of maps where there was going to be pre-play stuff. Uh, typically I didn't pre-place units. I pre-placed certain buildings and stuff like that. Uh, it really depends on the context, though, of, like, uh, assaulting the space platform. Of course, the space platform is going to be full of defenses and stuff like that. Um, it was something that would need to be balanced out because there is no delay for this stuff coming online. So there would be, uh, it'd be, it'd be quite a hard start for the player, for sure. Right. Um, 
there was heroes in certain cases as well. That's kind of a long thing, so I won't get into that at the moment, maybe later. But um, I was really delegating, like, I was all really conflicted because there was hero characters, but I didn't want the player controlling them. So I was potentially going to implement uh, something like Heroes of the Storm. We could, like, waypoint objectives and stuff like that, or ping objectives and the AI controlled heroes would deal with them or stuff like that i also was struggling a lot like i didn't want you to be able to suicide them i wanted there to be some cost but i felt that cost of resources and time was too stupid and didn't make any sense for resources for uh heroes so there was a lot of different like mechanics and stuff i was considering for that uh early into apex uh i had considered having a bullet time thing related to a resource called steps of the wanderer um, your player character had a health pool that was independent of all else in the map. And you could use Steps of the Wanderer, which allowed you to use a specific number of commands with an effectively time stop. And uh, Hero Revival was also based on that health pool as well. So that that was one, one idea that was going to deviate a lot from RTS. Uh, generally speaking, I avoid map-wide effects like that. So another thing I was considering adding in was the wizard towers way back in uh, when Armageddon Launcelot was still a thing. I was going to implement wizard towers from Age of Wonders. They have a domain, a, like an aura in which their effects can cast. They're effectively immobile spellcasters um, that you could tech up and uh, research stuff in and, and cast spells from support or offense and higher levels. Uh, you know, things like uh, auras or healing effects or attacks. Or environmental effects and stuff like that was uh, such a thing. It was an idea, anyways. I don't know. I don't think it would have played out too well because it would it would have been too powerful. Generally speaking, I try to avoid large effects like that, even when you have the uh, super units. Um, I say super units, and it's a really different idea than all these other games because all these other games they limit the amount of stuff you can build. That was one of the reasons why I didn't want to have heroes in the player's control because they're limited because the hero is a single unit. I didn't like that at all for anything heroes or otherwise so the, the super units are just you can build as many as you want you know if you got the resources so those are things like battleships with point defense uh battle moons space stations stuff like that very large things that may have like components on them or something like that that you can construct or upgrade independently you know fairly complicated stuff um that might cost like 20 30 thousand minerals and gas each and uh typically wouldn't cost supply uh, but it had to be built outside of a factory or something you build with an SCV or something like that. Um, so that, you know, you need to build space and stuff. So th those are like certain things that we sort of like splinter away from what is typically considered an, an RTS, a melee situation. We still sort of keep it at an RTS, though. We're more or less thinking about how can we take a campaign mission and make it more about, you know, exploring the world than just uh you know the 1v1 2v2 kind of situation how can we explore the world without using a lot of different you know dialogue and, and cinematics and stuff like that the project was already going to be quite dialogue and cinematic heavy between missions we weren't going to have those inside the missions and a lot of this stuff in the context of the missions we weren't really going to touch the cat jumped down i tried to feed her and she was just like no i'm gonna leave now so now I expect my grandmother to call me in about five minutes and say the cat's bothering her, so because she's too la she's too lazy to feed the cat. Rude. So, um, what I was saying was that the game is already really dialogue heavy, so I didn't want to like talk too much about tech trees or stuff like that within the dialogue. So we had to explore a lot of that stuff through actual player exploration. So I, that's one of the reasons why we have very large tech trees. We have these you know super high tier stuff that we unlock later on in the campaign. We have uh, many different kinds of defensive structures, research structures, and stuff like that. And in a lot of ways like this, we deviate a lot from melee because melee tries to keep your tech tree and stuff as small as possible and have as few units as possible. Uh, so there isn't a lot of overlap. But um, especially in the missions where we start looking at the player managing 10 plus bases at a time, we wanted there to always be some kind of large scale project for the player to like work towards. So the tech trees became very, very, very expensive to progress through once you reach like tier four, tier five. You're looking at 10k plus minerals and gas each to progress into the next tier and start unlocking stuff, especially things like the mass fabricators, the gas fabricators, stuff like that. Were all quite expensive, took a lot of space and stuff like that. 
So we always wanted to have the player to have something to reach towards in terms of the tech tree and what they were building. Which meant that we also had to design our maps in a really non-standard way. Uh, obviously, we don't use symmetrical maps except for man-made structures where it makes sense. So there was a lot of cases where I would do stuff that you normally would not do in a melee map in terms of how resource allocation was done. There was areas where there was clusters of expansions, lots of very, very limited build space, some very open build space. Um, for example, in the first map, uh, I know I talked about that some time ago, where there was the infrastructure you could take over. Right. Um, there was a bunch of landing bays with resources, tons and tons and tons of minerals just laying around, but it was super open and very, very easy for you to get uh, dropped on or otherwise attacked on by anything with range because you couldn't really bottleneck anything in that area. Uh, you basically had to defend at a much more distant area to prevent enemies from getting in there, or you had to be prepared to fight a really, really open arena. So there was there was lots of sort of like non-standard expansion places like that that really just you don't see in melee because they're not balanced, especially per races. So a lot of stuff that's like also just not balanced um, between the races themselves. Things like... Um, uh, Zerg really like to have uh, close expansions because they like to have more expansions and they scale differently based on expansions than everyone else does. So if you have like, I think it was two expansions next to the base um, and Terran and Protoss could take those expansions, they had much more of an advantage over the Zerg because the Zerg always wanted to have enemy expansions plus one, at least in Brood War. And that was something, obviously, when you're talking about AI, that really doesn't apply because the AI always has advantages over the players, and they also don't use their economy as well as players to begin with. So you always had to keep uh, sort of like how the player is scaling in terms of how they're building stuff and researching stuff in terms of what the enemy's exposure is. You have to think about that in a different way than you do in Melee because in Melee, uh, you usually think about player versus player and then AI afterwards because the AI is built upon the player framework and the AI may have advantages like free money or whatever, but since you're all starting off in the same table, it's kind of different. But in a campaign mission, you throw that out immediately because your map is already non-symmetrical and usually the distances between your opponents is also a lot higher. So that also influences things a lot too. What you would see with most typical AIs, they'll just end up floating tons of money and never actually use it. So... Uh, the way I scaled a lot of stuff is by having the AI take over places and then build structures there so that there was uh, a much greater emphasis on environmental awareness in terms of where the AI is building and why. Rather than just AI takes a base, it's the AI takes over an area and builds like 30 structures there. So there's a lot of like sort of non-standard game flow in that regard. It's where we have a lot more emphasis on the macro in terms of, you know, the whole map situation versus, oh, he has five expansions. I need to stop him from ferrying workers or kill some workers or whatever. It's more like I have to go here and destroy the 30 barracks before they actually start building stuff. Um, of course, in the, the AI is also a little bit more resilient to losing its main base. So in larger maps that are more open in terms of like free-for-alls and stuff like that, it, there's a bigger emphasis on actually finishing off opponents than there is in most single-player campaigns because uh, they will rebuild elsewhere and that's something you don't have in standard blizzard games because they are their ai typically doesn't support that um yeah so uh the other thing is i really emphasize away from melee is uh usually resources last longer uh since the game length is a lot longer than the 15 minute target that blizzard has in starcraft 2 we were usually looking at around an hour and a half to two hours per mission Within Apex, um, the way I handled resource distribution was different in that there was either more expansions or the resources were higher, so they lasted longer. Uh, this was also determined on a positional basis. So a more safe area may not have as many resources as a less safe area. Right. To really put emphasis on you holding that area and playing well versus yeah. uh, letting the AI take it and then just ignoring it. Well, there's also tons so, of different other things that you can do, like, oh, this this base leads to a pathway that's super important for map control, or this is a contact point mm -hmm. between... So it's like, there's many different ways to balance that stuff out, which you don't... You, sometimes you will see in melee contexts, but it's not as... Um, 
I, I almost say it's not as expected in campaign contexts because usually people who make campaigns unfortunately don't know what the fuck they're doing. But yeah, they if you're to make an actual game with it, right? If you're removing, uh, you know, you kind of have to set that to one side when you're talking about ways to make objectively good content and you know within the field of custom campaigns in that sense. Um, so when you're talking about like stuff that's not symmetrical, but it has a reason to be not symmetrical, uh, that's when you have to really figure out what what this what kind of impact I guess this has on the game state. Like you were talking about the distances being pretty far apart when it comes to you know one player versus another. Um, like, was there an example of this in your bunker rush map, or was it a close proximity for the bunker rush to actually take into effect? Uh, the later half of the map, in particular, uh, once you defeat the bunker player and move on to other portions of the game, uh, what ends up happening is you uh, will face the other opponents who are on the opposite side of the map. And Oh, I see. Uh, they cross through what is effectively like a large ravine which with a bunch of smaller ravines going into them. So the map is kind of separated in half. Now, the area that you can take over and create for your ally is in the bottom left. And the enemies are in the top left. So you basically can, at that point, choose to try to take as much uh, central and upper terrain as possible or focus on setting up your ally and getting rid of their production that they have in the bottom left before they uh, actually begin to make use of it. If you ignore it and fail to really deal damage to them, and then at that stage, what you start facing is an opponent that... Uh, has all the resources that you failed to take for them, plus this massive production facility, you were not successful in denying them. Right. So at that stage, uh, that's the other thing that we end up having is, is a lot of the times uh, when I use pre-play structures and stuff like that, I ended up separating map objectives. Uh, objectives in the loose sense, you're not told specifically what to do. You are just given the map and it's like, hey, you know, figure it out. And what ends up happening is tech can be located in one place, production can be located in another place. Uh, the enemy isn't necessarily always uh, perfectly set up. Usually it's like something that's just partly set down and then the AI will finish it as the map starts. And things like, you know, this base may have a command center and some SCVs, but it doesn't have defenses yet. So uh, the player really has, in such cases where there is such pre-play stuff, the player is encouraged to scout it out because they usually can do something about it right away. Um, since the AI usually will not start with a lot of resources in those cases. And the AI will then slowly ramp up. I, so I did find it kind of neat that you said that you specifically pre-place structures as opposed to units, which is kind of like yeah. there's this military infrastructure here for, and it's like a, not active because there wasn't a threat here before. And so here's the one way that you can reclaim that from the defender's point of view or destroy it from the attacker's point of view before it really has a chance to be impactful by itself, which is... Not usually the case. So in this particular case, were you dealing with something that was neutral and was rescued by the player that, like an AI player would move units over there to rescue it? Or how did they reclaim it per se? Did they actually own it from the start and just didn't have the money to use any use it at all? Uh, or Your AI ally? No, no, no. I just mean so. in the case where you had pre-placed structures that weren't, like no, no pre-placed units, but you did have pre-placed structures. Did, were they owned by a player that would oh, use them when they had money? They were owned by the enemy, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Basically, the way it was written out in the story is the AI set, like the AI opponent set all this infrastructure up, and then they used it to attack the defenses that surrounded you initially. Now, that attack was since repelled, and you defeated the invader that infiltrated this area. So now they're at that period where it's like they expended all their army and all their resources on the army, and they expected that to be a fatal push, but it wasn't. So now they're kind of sitting there thinking, huh, well, I guess we got to double back and start defending now. So uh, there's that sort of lull period between them attacking and being unsuccessful, and now you counterattacking. So you have that period to really make a big difference and uh, push ahead, push out, and do something before they're able to double back and reinforce. Gotcha. So, that's uh, like one of the really important parts about that particular area. In the other areas, usually what ends up happening is, is um, you are attacking an enemy infrastructure. And depending on what the mission text is, it's like, are they aware that you're coming or are they not aware that you're coming? If they are aware that you're coming, it doesn't make sense that you enter the area with no uh, standing forces to defend yourself. So usually what ends up happening is you are just given some extra resources to work with in the very beginning, or you have an AI ally that helps offset 
uh, your defense. I usually don't like pre-placing unit, units or buildings for the player because they're always going to be in a different position than what some player might want to put them. Of course, or yeah. Or they might be in a different position, maybe not necessarily, necessarily something they care about in their first playthrough, but most missions were going to require dozens of attempts to clear. So there was always going to be players trying different things, uh, which meant that you wanted to make sure that your pre place structures were not going to interfere with all kinds of potential builds and, and strategies. Uh, maybe the player might lift their command center and go somewhere else. So you want to avoid doing that. So usually I would just give the player some extra resources and then I would design the map in a way where you had an AI ally uh, where their pre play stuff doesn't matter at all. So they would just be there to maybe offset some aggression early on. Or I would pace out the beginning, which gave you a chance to do something. Um, it was something I decided based on the mission. Since the gameplay is so intricately tied with the story, I would just plan ahead to the point where I didn't encounter some kind of complication where I had to justify having a whole bunch of pre-play stuff for the player. I just wrote around that so that everything made sense on its own. Because... Um, if there was a case where the player needed to have pre-play stuff, uh, it had to have been structured in such a way where you weren't going to encounter a situation where that pre-placing felt awkward, depending on what it was you wanted to do. So it's uh, it, it's something you have to be very delicate with because it's just something that can just end up being a real nuisance. Like you, you, like the most extreme of it is you don't want to be Blizzard sticking buildings in an intentionally inefficient way so it's more efficient to destroy them. Uh, like in Warcraft 3 where they place their town hall too far away from the resources and stuff like that. Yeah, there's not really any reason for them to do that as far as I know besides just to piss you off. No. So that, that's the kind of stuff you want to avoid. And uh, so I, I try to be, like, whenever I pre-play stuff, it's always going to be typically AI stuff and typically only structures, except in the most rare circumstance where they really need it. Like, the story calls, like, you're attacking a major stronghold. Of course, they're going to have a standing army. So in that case, I have to really, really carefully think through what the enemy player is going to have. Usually, I won't, like, since we're talking about such a high-tech thing, I'm usually not going to place a lot of low-tech stuff. I will place some of the high-tech stuff. Uh, for one, when the AI fully comes online and starts calling units for its attacks, it's going to make the first attacks unnecessarily difficult. And then you have to start compensating for that at the AI level, and you don't want to do that because you want the AI to be as flexible as possible given any given circumstance. Or the player blows up half of their structures and you've accidentally delayed the AI for some other situation that for some reason didn't happen. You want it to be as foolproof and as future-proof as possible. So I would avoid giving them a lot of low-tech stuff and give them high-tech stuff uh, that they will call upon later in the script. And uh, so they might have some of the battleships or other such defenses, but not necessarily like hordes of marines standing around. Um, because then the AI, then it makes more sense also from a writing perspective that the opponent's going to be a little bit more careful with their more valuable units than if they had thousands upon thousands of expendable units, the player would ask, well, why aren't they just suiciding me with everything? Kind of like any time you play Blizzard's campaign, you wonder why are all these units just standing around instead of doing something? It also gives the player a little bit more of a reward if they actually manage to destroy that high-tech stuff early on because it usually takes a lot of resources and a lot of time to construct. So this, destroying those will delay uh, the opponent entering late game situations as well. So it, it's just more, a little bit more beneficial to do things that way as well. Um, which again is non-standard for melee because now we have like a non-standard sort of a lopsided difficulty curve where you are usually facing high tech stuff with low tech stuff. So uh, we put a little bit more emphasis on decision making and unit control from the player. Uh, where you had to really be, be careful with your micromanagement to overcome those kinds of challenges. But uh, let's take, for example, a Zerg map. Uh, what the Zerg starts off with is usually just a bunch of hatcheries. So the hatcheries and then some drones and then an overlord. And then they harvest and then they build their defenses and stuff like that. So it's, uh, and then your ally, I think Larry started off with Justice Command Center and then you had the AI hero defending the ship, and then that was it. That was your start off. So that was like your typical map. So anything outside of that was very, very, very unusual. Well, I got to hand it to you because that sounds like, a, for one, it's a, uh, it's a lot more flexible than the position I've tried to take lately. And it's uh, certainly 
got more of an involvement, like uh, it solves the issue of the story writing connection to the actual gameplay that you're experiencing. Although one thing that I will say, I'm, I doesn't sound like I would be a fan of in, in a context where this is a released project that I could play, is the amount of actual difference but from map to map in term that's in that case I suppose maybe something that could offset it is the fact that you have uh you're talking about targeting pretty long map times so if i decided to treat or conceptualize each map as its own sort of chapter that wasn't as intrinsically linked like the experience of playing map one was not intrinsically linked to the experience of playing map two or something to that effect uh, is probably a clunky way of explaining it. But if I try to separate it out in my head, as opposed to, uh, as, you know, treating them all as the one part of the same whole, uh, maybe that would help to s sort of split the difference there. But uh, basically what I've decided to do, at least I'm trying to explore right now is having as little deviance as possible from a melee starting condition where everybody in Hydra, you start out with six workers yeah. instead of four and you have a hundred minerals instead of 50, but otherwise that's it. And everybody has that. And uh, including all the AI. Now, currently an issue that we do have, even though after I uh, have optimized the scripts pretty heavily is the fact that uh, the AI, the Zerg AI in particular are really, really bad at, you know, getting efficient, um, their money's worth out of their units. And uh, in my latest AI cast over video where I cast it over a, an AI game where it was three Terrans against three uh, Zerg, I was explaining why Zerg were so bad. It's because Zerg need to get a lot more mileage out of their units in the early game because they're cutting drones so that they can tr produce units from their larva instead of drones from their larva. And they also have to produce their supply from their larva. And because they're cutting drones, they have less money than the other races. Because they have less money, they have less units. And it's like a vicious cycle that until they can really get to that three, four base count where they have you know sort of half saturation at all those bases or an average of half saturation at all those bases which is basically just having two two uh bases from any other race any other race's perspective they are in a much better position when it comes to actually producing an army and, and uh being a threat on the map and until that point you know they can do some really fancy stuff with micro but the ai can't micro as of right now and because of that they are uh, basically super easy to push over they'll send you uh, pretty decent attack timings but what they do with those units after they get them is really just horrifying to behold because of how bad it is so yeah that's a pretty big issue and it's sort of what you were talking about with uh the ai having uh, you kind of conceptualized them it sounds like anyway and this might be me reading into it feel free to correct me if this is the case but it sounds like what you were doing is you were conceptualizing the ai as sort of players on an uh, in a play or or something like, that, like actors in a movie or something more, at the yeah. early stages of the game but where you call upon certain aspects of their script to happen at certain times uh, while it's still trying to maintain flexibility so that the ai can still do everything you want it to do um which is ultimately just give the player a challenge, despite the fact that its production structures may have been destroyed or some other side objective or ancillary objective may have been accomplished by the player where they take away an asset of the AI. But uh, it sounds like they were more like they had sort of prescriptive uh, uh, traits or jobs associated with them. They had roles yeah. to perform uh, tasks to perform that weren't necessarily related to a melee player in that sense. Whereas I'm coming at it from a different approach and certainly finding it difficult right now, based on uh, the fact that I do have an AI income multiplier, but it's universal for all AI. And unsurprisingly, Protoss is a moving the entire fucking map, including our most <laughs> experienced players are just rolling over to those guys. If they get four gate, they have like 11 zealots in your base at three and a half minutes. So yeah. you just have, there's no counterplay to that. So like, that's one of those cases where the current lack of micro disproportionately affects different races. And then you have the fact that, Obviously, I'm still trying to make it so that they're, in theory, melee players that are always trying to win. So you gave the example of a Blizzard map where they had a bunch of pre-placed, you know, basic shit that you could consider expendable from a uh, commander's point of view in a sort of immersive, real story environment. And obviously, if, you know, they have all that pre-placed shit, the question becomes, why don't they A-move me with it? So the way that I sort of had in mind to answer that question in Hydra's campaign maps, where... You would have, say, the first Protoss mission is a 3v3, just like the first Terran mission is actually a 3v3. Very similar starting situations for those two races' campaigns. But one player is being reinforced by two Zerg, and the other player is being reinforced by two Terran in the Terran map or two Protoss in the Protoss map. And so you're actually coming to the aid of somebody in your um, 
in your Protoss map example, uh, and so it's you and your your co-op ally, be they an AI or a human player if you're playing it in two-player co-op, and you've got an AI ally in the middle of the map that's been fighting against another AI in the top left of the map. You guys are starting in the bottom half of the map, and then elsewhere on the map in top right and mid right, there are Zerg that are, have just arrived as well to reinforce the Zerg that's already been here and been attacking. And so in that sense, it makes sense to have some pre-placed assets for the, re the the player on either team that's being reinforced. And it balances out because it's symmetrical because you have, you know, one player starting out with, you know, a gateway, a couple zealots or whatever. And then another player starting out with spawning pool, maybe uh, uh, enough starting resources to almost immediately go for an expansion or something like that uh, for what the Zerg would want. And that would allow, you know, there to be some disparity there. And then you'd have that little bit of prescribed action where you know the starting players on either team the players that have more starting stuff on either team end up attacking uh the you know one another in the early stages of the game thus scouting out the main opponent of each team and then the other players would sort of come online at around the same time that you would in theory because you're starting out on the same foot as them so that was one way that i had in mind to try and fix that issue before it really started, but it doesn't work in every context. And in some contexts, it's even more unbalanced. Like the first Zerg mission is actually a 2v2v1 with Protoss stragglers trying to uh, sort of regain their former glory after being rolled over. And then you've got Terrans who are just, they just lost their entire fucking government because they're ex-Confederates. So they have no idea what the hell's happening and they're trying to, you know, rely on their old tactics and training. And uh, they have, I think one of them, like the one of the factions is actually without an, a leader entirely. So they're trying to take cues from the other guy. So they're like trying to co-op it in a little bit. But currently in the in the current builds right now, the uh, Protoss obviously just fucking roll over them because Protoss is insanely powerful right now. And uh, so in situations like that, I mean, you'd almost think, think that because the Protoss are by themselves, it would make sense for them to start out with more pre-play stuff. But based on our current performance, that would just destroy the entire map even more than it already is. So... That's when, you know, I, I do have to wonder at some point, obviously the AI is going to be updated and we're going to get performance improvements out of them and it's not really going to be that, you know, as big of an issue in theory. But I do also have to wonder whether or not it makes sense to, uh, essentially, what, what would your take be if you, if you were told somebody was doing what I'm doing where they're trying to more or less restrict the AI and the, all the players in the map, at least in the early levels of the campaigns to be starting around the melee environment? Like, how would you approach something like what I'm trying to do in essence? Um, there, I've actually had a lot of similar, uh, stuff like that. Um, there is a map, let's see, I, I was actually trying to recall what the missions were in the last Apex design. So there was a first one with the Bunker Rush, and, uh, after that you had to attack the installation they had around the shield. I think, I'm pretty sure I've gone through all this stuff in a previous cast, too. They had to attack something surrounding a shield uh generator that was being drilled so that was another right. one that was basically it like i always had a goal to try to make it as close to melee startup as possible if there is pre-play stuff it was for some really 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 specific stuff so i think the time we started seeing a lot of pre-play stuff was when we attack the orbital facility uh that's when we started seeing shit with the defenses being pre-placed and stuff like that so that was an important one because uh, we were going to have, let's see, I think it was a two versus four, two versus five, something like that. So that was going to be a pretty rough one. Uh, coming out of that, we were going to, let me try to think. So I was like, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking I want to have as few maps as possible that take you out of uh, melee startup. For one, it's harder to set up those maps. So you want to avoid them as much as possible because it's unnecessarily difficult to set up pre-placed maps. It's so much harder to balance them out. It's harder course, to yeah. populate them. Yeah, it's so, one of the hidden advantages of trying to go for like an AI-driven, melee-driven approach is that you, you know, there's like it's not like people who are making melee maps have to do an inarduous, a crazy amount of work. They, they've obviously got to balance stuff. But when it comes to actually making the map, they just start the game. <laughs> you know, like th that's how they play test. Yeah. They just start it. So no triggers necessary. So stuff like that it obviously takes a lot of the edge off of the actual production. You can just get right yeah. into play testing once the AI is up. So, you know, so I was specifically looking to target that as much as possible, which meant we needed to basically uh, 
uh, I was basically designing the writing around that as much as possible to uh, find situations for the player where we were looking specifically at, you know, creating situations where we didn't feel the need to have that much pre-play stuff. And we were able to accomplish that quite a bit. Um, cause after we leave the facility where we're going to attack, uh, a f I think we were attacking a fleet. It's been a little while. So the fleet in itself is not set up. It's a large group of ships, but it ends up leaving and then you end up getting jumped by a group, uh, and fighting a guy, uh, one V one. So that's another melee map. And then I think that was actually all of chapter one. So when we go into chapter two, we start that one off attacking a very, very large facility where they're constructing battlements. So this is an area where there's going to be a huge amount of pre-play stuff, but all that pre-play stuff is uh, basically a part of that facility. There's some civil architecture, there's a bunch of different sub-faction architecture and stuff like that, and most of it's not really ready for combat yet. So a large portion of the early mission is actually just destroying uh, this infrastructure, killing civilians, and doing all other sorts of stuff like that to clear a space for your attack and your, your own production. Uh, and then uh, during this point, the enemy that's going to be facing you during this map is they're setting up largely from scratch as well. So now we have sort of a melee situation where it's just like a lot of, like, not really neutral, but sort of like non-combat pre-play stuff in the map. And then some defenses protecting uh, particular areas you can choose to uh, take out to say, for example, secure resources and stuff like that. So definitely having the large uh, mission time is a pretty critical aspect of keeping this sane and keeping the missions feel somewhat consistent. Uh, I do agree that if you were having smaller, more typical mission times, you really don't want to be changing them too much. You don't want to enter the really, really bad like mini game carnival kind of thing because it's really awkward to play. It's really, really disruptive and it just isn't fun. StarCraft II, a great example of just what doesn't produce entertaining gameplay whatsoever. Every fucking 50 minutes you're thrown into something else and it doesn't last long enough to have any substance and it really just like wasn't given the opportunity to have substance. And if you're going to do something like add in a lot of pre play stuff or stuff like that, it has to be done in an instance where it has an opportunity to have substance. You shouldn't do it just because it's convenient and it's not convenient. It's less convenient. You should do it because it makes sense and you've written around it to the stage where you can think, okay, I can make this work like this and this is what it's going to contribute. You have to think right away what it's going to contribute. In our first map where there's pre-play stuff like the structures and stuff like that, the vast majority of it is already destroyed by combat. So the, it's really like only small portions in the map that really have a lot of pre-play stuff in it. And it's typically for the sake of having those map objectives uh, so that you have something to work towards other than just taking resources and that's it. So it's something that you can work towards and um, or you can choose not to work towards it too. You can choose to ignore it and just turtle and, and take expansions that are more easy to get or whatever. Um, but since the AI is more active in this and not just like Blizzard where it's fed an infinite amount of money it doesn't actually do anything with, then we get into the situation where we are already using this to teach the players that we're doing things a little bit differently than the window lickers at Blizzard. And that means that the player has to pay attention to stuff that might seem tried and true and normal, but it isn't tried and true and normal. They would discover this very quickly just by the bunker rushing thing, but they're also going to discover this if they ignore those production structures because suddenly they're going to start producing like three dozen units in a couple minutes. So if you choose to ignore them, then yeah, the consequences will be very, very obvious right away. So that's the other reason why we typically don't do that because the way the diff difficulty scaling can be handled by the AI is going to cause a huge swing depending on certain things. But uh, that's also sort of the field you enter when you start dealing with this stuff. So I think typically like your, your idea was perfectly, perfectly fine. That's normally how I would have done it, too. It's just, uh, you know, if you're going to put the player on the starter ground, there should be a, most certainly a counterbalance to that. That is definitely how I would have done it, is uh, having that counterbalance where you start off uh, with an AI ally 
that is more well situated and then there's a bunch of enemies that also start off uh largely from scratch as well um i was trying to think of the mission designs for my shit but honestly it's been too long but i know that the pre-play stuff was few and far in between um it was just like the ai would usually do really weird stuff like the zerg the first zerg map the ai starts off with extra hatcheries but what they actually were supposed to do this is what i couldn't get starcraft 2 to do is just build more hatcheries everywhere they were they're basically were going to use a large amount of resources just to cover the map and hatcheries and then as time goes on then they sort of start to come online uh, where they start producing oceans and oceans of units. So uh, a, part, a large chunk of that map was going to be on the defensive because of the guy spamming stuff like infestors and vipers and yanking your buildings into the water. But a large chunk of it was also going to be trying to just prevent them from building so many hatcheries that when they do come online, it's too much to deal with them. So it was, it was actually sort of like an approach to the zombie horde idea where... You know, all these zombie games, it's basically like uh, Minecraft with crafting. And you just chill out inside, and zombies come, and you build up until you've got your diamond pickaxe of pussy slaying plus 69. And then you go out and start smacking people with it. It's sort of like the idea, but there is no hard set rule of now is your time to attack, now isn't your time to attack. It's more like you have to play well to create those opportunities. So if you allow yourself to get held up by the uh, weaker Zerg that will be harassing you throughout this period to the point you can't take control of the map, then the end game just becomes more and more and more difficult. And that was the kind of uh, experience I really wanted to cement with things like, you know, if the AI has more resources or stuff like that, it isn't necessarily funneled into just forgating you and instantly killing you. It was more or less into building that narrative so to speak and then again we're trying to tell a story through the gameplay since we are using as little in-game dialogue as possible and the best way we can do that is by having interactive elements something we can interact with and you're, you're always interacting with your opponent building stuff on the map so that's one way we can tell a story is just the ai will actually be basically trolling you they'll be making fun of you they're having fun with you they're building all this shit and it's really just because they can and meanwhile they're spamming you know infestors and stuff like that but as the fight goes on and the ai you know opponent starts thinking hmm, we're not winning and our opponent's putting up a little bit more of a fight than we really expected them to uh, maybe it's time to actually start taking this seriously and then you'll start seeing them like building much more powerful much more dangerous units uh, attacking high up. And if you've just sort of ignored them to this point because they didn't really see like much of a threat beyond taking over the map and hiding expansions and stuff like that, then you get into the situation where uh, <laughs> all those hatcheries are now building leviathans, devourers, you know, guardians, stuff like that. So, Right, so it's basically like it's almost like the AI in the early stages of the game are uh, testing you in a way where they're not really respecting you as a player. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it's a reflection of the uh, personality that's controlling them or giving direction to them. So I suppose I could definitely see a reality where something like that could happen or could even fit in some of my projects. I guess the, the key difference here is for Hydra, obviously it's a sort of reimagination. It's like using the uh, original version of, or the first three campaigns as like a premise. Three. Yes, three. The first three campaigns of the original game is a, a premise. Basically, it's like, yeah, this is uh, actually a remake. And then people play it and they just get fucking destroyed in the first map by a sunken rush. Mm -hmm. So, like, in my respect, I'm actually just straight out every AI is trying to kill the player. Like, every AI wants yeah. to kill them. And it's obviously a more... I mean, it's it's not as like uh, I guess it's not as convenient for me to throw out the excuse of oh yeah they're trolling you sort of like what you were talking about where it makes sense in your world in my in my setting or whatever I don't really have a story for my stuff but because it's again it's just Blizzard's story which isn't a story so I just don't I don't really even pay attention to the narrative implications of anything beyond I want to make sure that the player knows that they are here to die if they're playing this like that's what they're here to is like either be good enough or you just don't win. Um, and obviously, we're kind well, of far away from Keep in mind, in now, these but... maps, like, the one Zerg is building a lot of hatcheries and stuff, but there's also attacks like 40 lurkers in five minutes. 
And the one Zerg will actually throw like 300 supply worth of infestors, vipers, and other shit on you who have custom tactical AI. So it's lighthearted in a sense that they're doing some really, really silly shit. But the actual lethality of what's going on is still super, super high. Okay, yeah, that clears it up a little bit then because um, in my case, I would still have them doing like strategies that are viable. But I guess the, the big distinction is I don't have the luxury or I feel like I don't have the luxury of, you know, providing a, an AI that has as many uh, sort of, I guess, inalienable advantages. So, for example, any sort of resource multiplier is an inalienable advantage. You can't really stop them from having the resource multiplier. You can stop them from mining, but you can't, you know, make it so that their money doesn't get scaled up that way. Yeah. And in the case of, uh, if I were to decide to increase the resource multiplier, particularly for Zerg, where maybe it would make more sense for them to have a faster spike time because, like, oh, yeah, they need more units to make up for the fact that they can't use their units very well, um, at least in the current rendition of the Zerg AI, that would make sense in theory to, to rebalance them in some capacity to make them more engaging and to give the player a run for their money, which is ultimately what I'm after is trying to make sure that the AI tries to kill the player instead of being dumb. So when I can do that, like that's one example, that's one way out, but it's definitely a temporary one because when we end up getting to the point where we have essentially tactical AI on a per unit basis where the AI manages its army in a way that's, you know, I won't say it's like a player because obviously AI can't really be like a player in that sense. The only way that you can do that is by doing some wacky ass gimmick shit where the AI like spams its workers behind its mineral line and spins them for a while and lags your computer. <laughs> uh, so since that's clearly the only way to, to do it, <laughs> uh, basically what I was thinking of, like, for example, it will take mutilisk uh, magic boxing. Like that's something that a player can do through selecting an, a slow ass overlord or a borrowed Zergling or something. In addition to their mutilisk control group, they can do that. And that's what allows them to do stuff like doing that uh, stacking of the mutilisks. And so that's clearly something that an AI should have no problem doing without selecting an overlord because they should just be able to issue clicks to, you know, orders to individual units and stack them up that way. And most people look at that and they think, well, because the AI can do that with impunity, uh, as opposed to it actually like taking time away from macroing and doing other things that obviously a human player has to take time away from, uh, maybe AI shouldn't do that because the uh, there's no drawback. It actually makes the units OP. But I think that if I can program the AI to do something like that, um, well, with some understanding that obviously after a certain point the player just can't and you know can't answer to it by uh, microing with marines or something. They have to actually build Valkyries or irradiate them or do do something else other than you know what the conventional uh, melee or like pro play counters would look like or they have to attack the player's base to draw the mutilisks away from a ridge behind their natural or something like that where they're they're getting destroyed and so in this particular case like as far as i'm concerned i don't think that the ai needs any built-in limitations per se if i can make it be really really good then we just remove the inalienable advantages it has and we you know we start stripping away the resource multiplier we tone it down until we eventually don't need it anymore and we remove it entirely and then you know, in obviously in melee environments, that's what we're targeting is eventually an AI that doesn't need any cheats, that uh, doesn't metagame and actually has to scout and can survive not having that worker's worth of efficiency on their resources. They can scout early on and figure out where the enemy is and uh, figure that out based on that. So in theory, like that's that's our di very distant goal is to target something like that where we don't have to worry about the AI basically having some sort of... Uh, uh, abstraction over the player's own tools because the player has a tool set and it doesn't include resource multiplier it doesn't include you knowing exactly where all enemy units are on the map even if i you know they don't act on that knowledge because the ai in brood war does know w which regions are populated by enemies so they know exactly all that stuff they know where everything is in that sense even if they can't like see it actively and they don't usually respond to troop movements anyway even if they could see them because they're dumb so when they have situations like that, the more inalienable advantages we can strip away, the better. The more we can replace, you know, bad play or lazy play that only works because of those inalienable advantages, like spamming extra units because you have extra money to do so, uh, the better, generally speaking, because it's a uh, less abstraction or, or there, there are less abstractions on the gameplay. It's more 
like what the player is dealing with. And the player can imagine that if the AI can do that, then they can figure out some sort of solution to it that doesn't involve having some sort of money cheat, essentially, or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. And so that's really, I think, where I have a personal aversion to trying, to, like, re-enabling a higher tier money cheat for Zerg or something like that, even though it seems like that's probably what I'm going to have to do as a temporary fix until we end up getting, you know, improvements to the micro uh, sort of tactical AI side of things. Because until then, Zerg are just going to be disproportionately fucked, as I said earlier. So in that sense, you know, when you're talking about your campaign maps where you've got Zerg that are sort of uh, doing meme strategies the immediate response I have is like, you know, how much, uh, how much more dead would I be if I died to that? How much more dead would I be if the AI actually took me seriously? And then I think like, you know, how many strategies even exist that are viable in that reason? And, and so that's where I, I do start to wonder, you know, what, what the solution would be in that sense. Because if you consider the sunken rush that I talked about, that is, that is actually something that does happen in the first map or will happen in the first map when I have the AI set up. The uh, AI will slowly push out with creep colonies, and they're on the same height level as one of the um, one of the players. Actually, not not even like an AI ally of the player, but these. If you're playing it in single player, your base is on the same height level and on a same connected path that is buildable eventually if you spread enough creep. Uh, and the natural of your AI ally of one of your AI allies is right there as well on the same height level in in pretty close proximity to this player that opens up with a nine pool and then tries to fuck you with sunkens. And so mm-hmm. like situations like that, I think are kind of neat because it's very much a non-standard approach. It's obviously very much not something you would see in a melee game, but this could work. I mean, this AI's personality, if you want to call it like a scripted role, I would align it more so towards the... Uh, role a certain player has on a team. So if you're playing a 3v3 and you have a close position to an enemy and then you know that your ally specializes in building nothing but battle cruisers but doesn't come online until 20 minutes because they are really stupid at b- and can't build marines, then you know, hey, I've got an AI, you know, an AI ally. Uh, this is a real person, by the way. But <laughs> I've got a real human being who's doing this. Uh, I better defend them. Uh, so I'm going to buy as much time as possible. And then like that's your strategy is to actually block off with a bunch of sunken colonies. That could be a legitimate strategy in that sense. And that's where I come up with like, all right, well, maybe it's okay that the AI is doing this stupid thing where they're spending some like thousands of minerals on sunken colonies. Um, but there's also a bunch of weird things like there's an upgrade for sunken colonies in Hydra that gives them uh, a secondary attack that deals half damage. So every attack, uh, it has to target a second unit, so it can't do it to one target. But you imagine like six sunken colonies can attack 12 Marines now instead of it being six. So you can imagine where that ends up being really, really deadly. Like this, that's an upgrade that requires Hive Tech, which is easier to get to in Hydra compared to, it's like a, a little bit cheaper to get to in Hydra compared to what uh, Vanilla was. But they probably won't be rushing that upgrade per se. But it's like if I have, you know, still if I still have like 10, 20 sunken colonies, suddenly they're going to get an upgrade that spikes their their efficacy up even more and you're going to need to you're going to hope you have tanks or, or air units or something to, to combat that because at some point you're just not getting through the phalanx of sunken colonies that is now in your natural and in your main uh, chewing at your buildings so that's what i hope happens that has happened in the past when i've been playing uh, play testing that map before it's uh, definitely something that's quite entertaining to see people die to where they just get sunken but uh, until we get to the point where we have really strong like tactical AI and stuff like that, I don't really see how we can make uh, stuff like that work. I guess another issue is the overhead of designing an AI that works mostly because of the fact that they have a uh, sort of income multiplier. You want to make your AI as flexible as possible so that it does the you know makes correct choices regardless of its resources. So in theory, if you write your code properly, it shouldn't matter what money they have. They should still be able to make intelligent decisions. But I do wonder if maybe there's some sort of situation where they try to, like, the AI performs really well when it has uh, the resource multiplier set to a certain level, and then they get some patches to them that improve their tactical AI, and then, okay, now it's time to turn down their their layout or their... uh, their resource multiplier in some capacity or their pre-placed units or whatever, uh, you know, inalienable advantage they have in a certain context. And suddenly that sabotages the entire balance of the map and you've got to do a bunch of redrafting. That also does uh, worry me. And the, the idea that that's, uh, that's possible, which I know from experience is very possible to have stupid shit like that happen. So I guess in that situation, it, it'd, it would probably be best to just almost release those as like a standalone thing or not bother trying to update those specific things. But I don't know what you have to say on on that whole topic in general. I, t- I obviously mm-hmm. covered a lot. All right. Well, there's a few things. I'll try to go over them as my memory goes on. 
I wouldn't release a project to a playable audience unless I felt everything was finished. Right. So yeah. there would be no patches to the AI or stuff like that unless something really severe came up because I wouldn't release something unless I had done basically what the absolute maximum capability I had was possible. Like I wouldn't release something where I felt that there was a significant update that could be done to the AI, uh, especially tactical AI, since it's such an integral thing. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was a little bit like, obviously uh, when you're building the, uh, the, the AI and you're, you're using cheats and stuff, I lamented and spent a long time thinking about the viability of like, what can we do about an AI that cheats? Is there any way to do it about cheats? How much do I actually give a shit if it cheats or not? And it really turns out I just don't care. Like, I spent a really long time debating on what I wanted the AI to be able to do. And if what it was doing was, like, really, like, visible to the players to the point it was detrimental. So things like the AI cheating... The AI is always cheating. The AI always knows where you are. It always knows where your units are. It always knows where they are, even if they're cloaked. It's always aware of all this stuff. 90% of the time, it's not going to be really obvious to you, except for when you've got like a cloaked observer and the attack wave is sitting on top of it and not <laughs> going anywhere until you move the cloaked observer because, yeah, like that, that's when it's really obvious. It's like, hey, the AI is aware that something is here when it really just should not be. Oh, and, well, whatever. Their commander saw the movement of the cloaked thing, and then yeah. they were like, all right, I better station my entire attack force here. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, let, let's sit on the observer for a while. So, like, there's Loot. a lot, like, you can uh, really stress out about a lot of that stuff, but some of the stuff you really just can't change, too. And, like, I held no illusion that a lot of this stuff would continue to be problems even when the project was finished. So at some point, I had to be like, well, I can spend a lot of time worrying about, you know, the AI is getting X or Y multiplier, um, or I can focus on making the experience of the, the project as a whole better. Like, there has to, at some point, be some concessions I'm going to have to make about whether or not certain things are going to turn out well. And, you know, a lot of things don't turn out well. I wish we could get through things without feeding the AI money, but... You know, throughout my history of making projects, I have yet to encounter an AI in any of these that's smart enough to fight me without really, 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 really massive advantages. And because you're working with something as limited and as gutted as Galaxy, you're no matter how much time you invest in a tactical AI, it's never going to compare to somebody of my skill level in terms of micro. It, it's just not possible. The system is just not flexible enough. It's just not fast enough. It's just not performance enough. You just can't do it. There are things you can do with the AI that are going to be impossible for people to do, like individually microing every single Marine. But all it really takes for the AI to fuck this up is one miscalculation, one mismovement, stepping a little too far forward, a little too far backward in one of these maps. Like, it's just not going to endure the test of time in an actual play environment meanwhile a lot of the advantages that you give the ai or that the ai already has because of what it is uh end up translating rather invisibly to the rest of the game uh like say for example the fact they can see observers when they're cloaked that's something that really only comes up when the attack wave decides to target that invisible observer and the observer hasn't moved and it's sitting on top of it that's when something really strange is coming up. That's when you get your head scratching. But a lot of the times, it doesn't really come up because they choose other targets or the observers are moving around and they never get chosen as a target for the attack wave or stuff like that. Now, in StarCraft 2, there is the big issue where you can just float buildings next to cliffs and the AI's attack waves will permanently sit there and do absolutely nothing, even with air units, because their air units will never actually leave the attack waves. So that's one of the really, really, really major issues that I hoped would get fixed by having air units with longer ranges. But it's one of those things that it's like, well, I better not have DC'd. No, you're fine. Okay, I just saw a notice on this, but it was someone in Hydro Channel. But um, it's like one of those things where it's like, I'm going to be permanently aware of this problem. This problem is always going to be there. And there really isn't a heck of a lot I can do about it. 
So it it god damn you piece of fucking <laughs> shit stop killing my damage dealer. God. So it's one of those things where it's like like there's just concessions you have to make if you're going to make this project possible and the AI is just full of so much hard code that I just can't really deal with. Gotcha. So it's like I don't really mind too much about the AI being fed money, but I have to compensate for it in other ways. Like I mean, I can just as easily, like, if I want to make the game as hard as possible, I can just say, okay, spawn Zerglings, attack players. Or spawn some other unit Zergling equivalent, so then they can access to and then just keep attacking until the player is dead. You know, we're taking a, a two versus five situation. It's not hard to do that. But now we are doing that for every single map, and every single map experience is going to be the same. So, of course, there's going to be maps in the future where the Zerg is going to be very aggressive early on. But in our first experience... We wanted to make something more about that first experience than just all oh, the players super aggressive early on taking advantage of, you know, the size of their forces or whatever. So I wanted to have the map, like the map's difficulty was going to be a jump up from the rest of the game. We were looking at a map where I think that in order to defeat this map, it was going to be the fourth or fifth map in the campaign. Uh, you were going to need to be master's level. You were going to need to have probably around 150 APM minimum. And you're going to have a pretty strong understanding of how the project works, uh, all the custom units and stuff like that. And that was just like the given. So up to that point, you could have gotten away with having a little bit less skill level, like maybe like high diamond or something like that, uh, could get through some of the other missions. Um, you needed to have that kind of unit control for sure. So... We were still looking at something that was very difficult, but the presentation was completely different. And the difficulty for the campaign wasn't even necessarily linear either. Some missions you might encounter uh, AI opponents that are super aggressive early on, but they don't tech up super hard either. So the way that the difficulty was going to transition between maps is I wanted the difficulty to increase in the game as he went on, but I didn't want every map to be exactly the same. So there are sort of like concessions I have to make where it's like, if I want a certain experience, the difficulty isn't necessarily going to be exactly the same, but I have to compensate for the advantages and disadvantages the AI has in any given presentation, which means that regardless of like pre-placed units or other objectives, I have to actually test the maps for months each. There has to be a lot of unit testing, a lot of individual tests for these maps to make absolutely 100% sure that you know, they're ready and that the experience is going to be very consistent. So what this means is that it's not, since we're no longer making something just based on melee, but we're still using a melee framework, the workload for actually making sure that maps behave well is substantially larger than just making a melee framework. Because if we're making a melee framework, it's really only going to be changed a lot by the individual maps. And, I mean, Brood War changes a fuck ton just based on distances and size of, of choke points and stuff like that. But now we're talking about something where we have that framework where we've added several extra layers of complexity on top of it. But since it's a, my projects were all exclusively single player uh, for the campaigns, they were never built on multiplayer frameworks, except for the really old ones that... I mean, that's like 14 years ago. I couldn't even begin to talk about those. I don't remember anything about them. But um, we were talking about something where the experience was the single player missions. But since your player's uh, units and the AI's units, those statistics don't change between the maps. We don't create special cases like fucking Blizzard does. We don't make maps that are gimmicks for single units or that you introduce a unit and that unit wins the mission for you. We don't want any of that shit. But what we are dealing with is an AI system that's very, very, very inflexible. And they have disadvantages. They're fucking dumb at handling units. You can chisel off 200 or 300 units off of either the AIs in these games, usually without even incurring a single loss. And the AI isn't even smart enough to acknowledge that this is happening. You can't even go to the AI and have a condition that's saying, hey, you're getting cheesed. Uh, we need to change something. And you couldn't even realistically program something that, that determines the situation that's happening, like certain cliff ledges or chokes being abused, and having the AI adapt based on that and choose this area as a danger zone and be like, yeah, let's not go here anymore. Let's stop going to this area. Let's choose a different region. 
that just doesn't exist. You would have to create this from scratch in the low level and then integrate it to the AI. And especially for StarCraft II, that is insanely unrealistic. Like, that is just not going to happen. So you have to, like, look at what advantages you've got and if you can make it enjoyable to the player. Ultimately, my goal is to make something that's fun to play. And, of course, challenging. That's where the fun's going to come from. So I look at the individual experiences and ask, okay, so what makes something fun? And at what point does the advantages or disadvantages the AI have turn into something that disrupts that fun? So I think that something that kills fun is if the AI is too easy to cheese. So one of the things I do when I'm designing the units and races is I think about the AI first when I'm designing units. I think about, is this a unit the AI will actually be able to use? If we have a unit in the tech tree that the AI is never going to use because they're inefficient with it, we're not going to have that unit. We're going to redesign it because we do not want something in the game that the AI is not going to take advantage of. Because if we have stuff in the tech tree that is just not being used by the AI, then we enter that situation with Brood War where there are units that people just don't use, except we don't even see them in the campaign or when we do, we don't even pay attention to them. Uh, defilers uh, for AI in <laughs> Brood War is absolutely fucking horrendous. High Templar are fucking horrendous. The Yamato gun is fucking horrendous. I would actually not let my AI uh, get Yamato gun because they were so stupid with it. <laughs> yeah, uh, you should try medics. You like the fact that they every yeah. medic on a map will run across the entire map to heal one damaged civilian. Yup. Yeah, and they and will ignore allied blind units incessantly on one overlord that has already been blinded because <laughs> it's all queued up. Yeah, so then at that point it's like, why would we have the AI use these units? Yeah, they, well, they don't even use Nidus. Right? They can't even like, use Nidus by yeah, default. So no it's like, Nidus worms. Like, so now we have all these exceptions for the AI because they're just too fucking stupid. So right from the ground up, I'm designing stuff with the AI in mind. Like, I don't integrate something that I think is going to be too complicated to build. Uh, something around for the AI, like in terms of uh, tactical AI. Um, like if I have healing mechanisms, like uh, medevacs, for example, I change those so they actually deploy a healing drone that fires a beam, and that heals stuff nearby. Now it's really easy for the AI to use it. Uh, we can make a, a trigger set where the AI is being attacked and drop these drones, and then the drones will just, the healing portion itself is automatic. The AI doesn't have to think to use it. Uh, but both the AI and the players have to actually put those drones somewhere intelligent and not let them get killed. So now we have a system where... Uh, I would just say that's a, something... that's an upgrade over the default mechanic in that case too, though. It's like, yeah. I see what you're going for as far as designing it so that the AI can use it, but I also think that's just better than the default medevac. Yeah. Yeah, so we're, you know, we're trying to make something that does require decision-making to use, but is you know also thinking, like, how will the AI use this? So when it comes to money and stuff like that, the player doesn't see what what resources the AI has. Um, but it can become really obvious that the AI has infinite money if, for example, they are non-stop spamming units on you over and over and over again. And in a lot of shady RTSs, the AI actually gains an increased uh, build rate as well, in which it becomes really obvious. Yeah, that's so disgusting. That's why I don't use injections. I use a multiplier. And the multiplier is something that I can even change on the fly. So, for example, when the game starts, when it's the most important, I may actually have the AI have no multiplier. But when we hit, like, mid-game, then we might start seeing a small multiplier, like 1.2, 1.3. But at the same time, like, if it, if it becomes something where it's an issue that the AI is just not presenting a challenge to the player, I have no grievances about feeding the money because ultimately it's like, uh, I would look at the project uh, being discontinued if... Uh, I can't make the mission play well. Like, ultimately, it was discontinued for other reasons. But the it's the same, like, line of thought where it's like, um, if it's a choice between the AI getting free money or scrapping the entire concept, I have right, no yeah. problem giving them some money. So, like, there are, there are definitely limitations. Like, it's the same thing where I just, I will scrap entire units if the AI cannot use them. Because ultimately, the AI needs to be able to at least be competent. The AI needs to present that experience. And... Yeah, my campaign design was definitely a lot different than uh, most of the other stuff. 
Um, it, it, like I mean, like I said, there is a lot of missions where it's just a straight melee. The AI is always going to be after you, but there are also missions where the AI is, uh, it, it represents a character and that character isn't necessarily going to treat you very seriously. Or maybe the AI has some other objective that doesn't involve, you know, bum rushing you right off the bat. So it's all about building that experience and then coming up with something that's actually enjoyable to play. And then each mission also is supposed to have its own kind of character about it as well. Which means that I wanted each mission to stand out from each other, even though they're like two hours long. Because if you have a yeah, if you have like eight missions and they're all two hours long and they all play out in the same way, then you may as well just have one mission. So Oh yeah, well this is actually a concern that some people had voiced to me when I explained that I was more interested in keeping things more similar than more different, right? When I was talking about how yeah. I wanted the melee starts to be very, very ubiquitous and have very, very limited pre-placed units, if any at all, compared to a melee start. And then, obviously, uh, I talked about tech trees, so we haven't even really talked about like how each individual mission might introduce new tech, and that being yeah. a way to separate missions from one another. Um, for one thing, I think it goes without saying, but missions like in Brood Wars, uh, I think it's the fifth Protoss mission or fourth Protoss mission or something, uh, where you just suddenly lose Stargates and everything that Stargates can train because of a single dialogue line Artanis delivers while getting sucked off in a bathroom by Zeratul. So that's great. <laughs> like, I, I'm really glad that that's why we don't have fucking Stargates. He just says we have a problem and then fucks off. So uh, that's really dumb. So whenever we introduce a tech option, like a new unit or an upgrade, you have some confidence or every confidence that, oh, I have this. I will always have this now from now until the point where I start playing a different camp races campaign or as a different race or whatever. As long as I'm playing as this race, I will have access to this upgrade or unit or whatever it is. And so we can always rely on that element of consistency. But I was also looking at providing uh, sort of like what you were talking about where at the end of, I think it was like at the beginning of chapter two, there was some Zerg mission you were just talking about where uh, in Apex you expected the player to have competence in the understanding of the game and and knowing what the yeah. custom units did so hydra is sort of assumes that the player has never played hydra before they started the first campaign mission i also have a light assumption that i'm not as strict on that if they start the first zerg mission i'm also going to provide a bit more onboarding time and missions like that where uh, maybe their favorite race is zerg so they skipped all the terran shit entirely and they've never played hydra and they just want to play the zerg campaign well i'm not really yeah. supporting it from the ground up but i do understand that that might happen so the first mission of any campaign naturally will end up having a little bit of more onboarding a little bit more uh you know maybe some sort of sequence that will help uh, acclimatize the player in this case it's for zerg it's like the oh there's a protoss attacking the terrans so the terrans are going to be annihilating us from the get-go they're going to be also dealing with protoss they got to be a little bit more uh conservative with how they open up and stuff like that and then for the protoss mission it's the fact that you know you got one protoss fighting one zerg that, and they've already been fighting and there's a little bit of a a sort of scripted sequence where they're attacking each other with their first attack, and then it opens up a little bit more generically where you have uh, other Zerg that are also starting out from scratch like you are. And so it sort of allows players to make the mistake of trying to play the campaigns without out of order uh, and allow them to uh, potentially salvage that mistake from the first try if they are good enough um, and also still learn enough about the tech trees and stuff as time goes on. But by the fourth or fifth mission in each 10 mission campaign or however long the campaigns end up being, but it's no more than 10, it might be nine or eight. Um, by the you know halfway point through those campaigns, you'll have the entire tech tree unlocked and there won't be any more new tech tree options. And that was one thing that I guess a lot of people didn't expect out of the, the campaign because of the sheer number of tech tree changes from the vanilla game, but also additions just mm -hmm. flat out. Like there's probably like twice as many units. Um, there's a significant number of, of uh, units and structures that are brand new. Uh, maybe not quite enough to be a, a Jay Wilson doubler, but pretty fucking close. So there's a lot of new, new options for the player. And the fact that they are going to have some of them from the get go in the first mission, and they're going to like the first mission, you go all the way up to science vessels and siege tanks. And like, you have everything in the factory, everything in the star purpose sides, battle cruisers and some of the new units. Uh, so you, you have quite a few uh, heavy duty tech tree units and the AI has everything like ultralisks. I'm still on the fence about defilers, but they have tier three tech from the get go as well. And everybody can upgrade all the way up to tier five upgrades, which is the maximum tier now instead of three, because three is for three. And then you get to the point where you're saying, okay, well, at some point I'm going to be stuck with this. There's not going to be any additional, you know, changes to the tech tree. There's not going to be any uh, unlocks. You know, we've got a uh, second mission introduces like ghosts and nukes and, uh, some other new units and stuff. And uh, eventually by the fourth or fifth missions, we've seen the entire tech tree for our race and presumably for at least one of the other races that has been featured thus far. So the Zerg are entirely 
in force and deployed, ready to go. And you know, the most you can look forward to is maybe like your AI ally uses a different uh, strategy that involves some of the new units that you haven't yet explored, but have been available already in like in the next mission or something like that. And obviously, the AI opponents and allies themselves will change from map to map. The environments will change from map to map. Perhaps some of the objectives will also be changing from map to map. So it's not just a straight up destroy the enemy buildings. We haven't even talked really heavily about objectives yet, but the mm-hmm. the idea being that halfway through the campaign, it's just going to be a test of your knowledge and ability and competence within the uh, element of, of mastering the new game state that is offered by all these tech tree units or tech tree changes. So in that situation, I don't know how, what your plans were by comparison, if you were still going to be introducing stuff in the second and however many other chapters you had planned uh, as far as the tech tree goes, but that was more or less my plan. And, and people were concerned that maybe the missions would end up feeling too samey just on the basis of the fact that, well, if you can't introduce new tech and you can't... Uh, you know, introduce like brand new enemies or play styles or, or entire new races or whatever, then how exactly are you going to make the maps different? If you're also going to be starting maps off very similarly to each other, how are they going to feel different? I feel like that's more conditioning from playing shitty campaigns that don't have any effort put into them. And so they don't realize that if the gameplay loop is really solid, uh, the, the campaign mission can be quite enjoyable even if it introduces nothing new and it's just actually default brood war tech tree if you have an ai that uses the default brood war tech tree very well uh and tries to engage you that can also be enjoyable in ways that you know all the custom campaigns in the world with all the tech tree changes in the world might not be enjoyable if they're just you know gimmicks or whatever so i think that's more so people just not knowing what to expect out of a a competently made mission or series of missions but uh what's your take on that as far as the tech tree thing is concerned specifically uh, I'll have to address that in a bit because I've actually got to run an AFK. Okay. And we're back. So, uh, yeah, tech trees. What about Okay. It? So, tech trees. Um, you actually were going to be progressing in the tech tree quite a long time into the campaign uh, for a couple reasons. One of which, because uh, you actually have multiple tech trees. So let's see, um, in the original Apex, Apex uh, H, when you get to fighting the Zerg and like mission four, mission five, you are going to unlock the Battlecruiser equivalent, which was uh, tier four, as well as light artillery. Uh, those are considered low tier, low tech. Uh, since Battlecruiser equivalent is a Corvette and you can make up to battleships and battle stations and stuff like that. But you weren't going to have access to those specific things for probably another 15 or so missions. Um, there is only the one campaign you don't switch between races. Uh, well, like you, you play different races, at least you did in that version, but uh, it was all linear. So you didn't have like a Protoss campaign, a Zerg campaign, a Terran campaign. You just had the one campaign. Um, but yeah, so, but when you started off, uh, you basically had up to starport tech. You basically could build the battlecruiser replacement, which was the gunship. So, and then there was a bunch of extra stuff on top of it, different uh, support structures, uh, defense structures, and uh, the tech-related buildings and stuff like that. So the tech equivalent was uh, a lot more dense and higher when you started than the end game of Brood War. Um, and each mission, you usually unlocked uh, specific features of that tech tree, or you entered another tech tree and unlocked the core elements of it and then got more features of it later on. Uh, but you also would, uh, were going to unlock secondary tech trees at the same time. So in most of the Apexes, you're actually managing three tech trees or four tech trees by the end of the actual campaign. So I think in the original like, Apex H versions and the ones preceding it, you had uh, Gracian tech tree, Confederate tech tree, uh, Necropolis, and Black Squadron. So... Uh, that changed a lot in the newer versions. It was just going to be the two, which was going to be eventually one. You are going to transition completely to the Black Squadron tech tree about halfway through the campaign. And then that was going to have its own shit. So yeah, you, you, were, you were progressing through a tech tree as, as the missions went on for sure. Um, but the individual things that were added and in, in contributing to the tech tree, there was so much more stuff in it that it really was going to change quite like the artillery in particular is a really big thing since they're more like supreme commander artillery they have long range they have an inaccurate shot you can fire into fog and war and stuff like that Uh, when you start introducing those it actually ends up changing the game quite a bit when you introduce the sdi system uh, which is tactical missiles and uh, uh, weapon systems that can target tactical missiles and equivalents uh, they end up changing quite a lot in the game so 
Uh, the introduction of that stuff was they all had like their own place within tech to do. So it's, uh, yeah, y you were progressing quite a lot through the tech trees. Obviously, the tech trees were something that weren't really set in stone. I had written out uh, some frameworks for them. But, uh, and, and not to linger too much on the actual tech tree specifically of your project, but I did hear you say earlier something to the effect of like, um, melee you, you you it wasn't necessarily a criticism of melee but it was an aspect of melee that you observed that they don't have a lot of overlap between unit roles or individual units i assume that means just by inference that you had some units that were very much identical in terms of combat role or but like had different stats or some other difference yeah something that differentiated them from an earlier tier counterpart or something so basically, let's take, for example, the battle cruisers. So you could build an entire fleet. You had carriers, you had corvettes, you had frigates, you had uh, cruisers, and they had battleships. Now, all of these are very similar. They all have guns. Most of them target different units at the same time. As you get higher in the tech tree, you basically get more value out of your supply. So that was really one of the big things is that having a battleship, it was more powerful than having like three or four corvettes. Uh, but it was also a little bit more conscious on supply as well uh, as a result of the investment of resources you spent getting into that point within the tech tree. So what that meant is that uh, they did overlap because they basically serve very similar roles. But uh, I designed, because I can change the behavior of their weapons and attack patterns quite a lot more, um, there was a lot more distinction how the unit units actually behaved. So they may have like very similar stats, but the way their weapons actually behave, the wind up, uh, the way the projectiles behave, the speeds and stuff like that, uh, tended to be uh, very different between them. So, um, but there was in general more overlap. One of the big things you have with the RTS in general is trying to keep the uh, unit count very low uh, in terms of how many distinct units there are, so that you have as little overlap as possible. But, um, like, say, for example, the Ghost and the Marine are both ranged attack units, but they both serve very, very, very different roles and they have very, very different uh, characteristics to how they deal course, damage. Of course, yeah. Uh, whereas within this, you might have, uh, between the races, uh, several different types of Marines uh, where the changes are less major but still significant. Like, uh, uh, the Confederate Marine was shorter range, did more upfront damage than the Gracian Marine. And the Federation Marine was a lot cheaper uh, than both of them, and more like an all-around standard, like a mix between them, uh, with a medium range and, and moderate damage and stuff like that. Um, but those were also different races, so those different like sort of factions between them as well. So uh, I was, hi, you have returned. You, you, you are a cat, and okay, meow, sure thing. I wonder the cat might want the other food actually, but I'll tend to her after we're done. Um, yeah, so obviously uh, I have to like play through the different units and stuff like that. But uh, specifically, especially for the AI races, uh, there was going to be a lot of different units that more or less are functionally very similar. But I wanted to have different variety between different maps and stuff like that. I didn't want you always fighting the exact same thing uh, throughout potentially like hundreds of hours of gameplay. So a lot of it was for the sake of having variety. But in, far in terms of the player's case, it was also about representing... Uh, advancements in uh, your economic ability. So in the end of the game, uh, you have already invested, you know, however much resources into advancing your tech. Um, so you can basically build better solutions uh, for the same kind of problems you may have had early in the game. Uh, so that was one way how I viewed that. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, when you expand the tech tree so much, you're, you're, going, to over, you're going to encounter overlap because... Uh, I mean, the way the game is expressed, the way that confrontations are expressed, it's always just unit attacks, unit, unit takes damage, that's that. There's only so many ways you can express that. So, yeah, there was definitely going to be a little bit of overlap, um, which obviously is one of the reasons why this wouldn't work in a melee setup. You couldn't right. really do that in a melee. I mean, you can do that in a melee gameplay, but it's not going to be as good as Brood War. And the way I feel it is that if you can't make something that's as good as Brood War, there's no point in even trying. And unless you're really, 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 really are trying to make Brood War, and chances are you're not going to, um, you're better off just not trying to make that kind of um, attempt. Because it's, it's like wasted resources as far as I'm concerned. Like, uh, other than Armageddon Onslaught and the early total conversions I did, after that, I gave up on making uh, multiplayer stuff completely. 
uh, for RTS because it's like, well, I know enough about Brood War to know that I'm not going to be able to create Brood War. I don't really have a drive to create Brood War, so I'm just going to stop making multiplayer. I mean, there's also because, you know, I had done all that could really be done in StarCraft at that point. StarCraft 2 was a bust. There really wasn't a platform to make RTS mods in anymore anyways, uh, unless you stuck with Brood War. So that was also one element, but it was also really the main thing is that, you know, unless you are capable of achieving the same kind of fluke that Brood War had, there is just no point in trying to do it. You know, it, it, it really isn't just no point because it's never going to be as good as Brood War. At, at best, it's going to be like a different kind of uh, viewpoint of Brood War. And that, to me, isn't worth the kind of energy and the massive amount of energy that it takes to really, like, fine-tune the aspects of your balance and stuff like that. And one of those elements is definitely adjusting your units to have as few as possible, as little overlap as possible, but each of them can be expressed in their own... Like, it, it, expressive enough that they're not all counters and shit like that. Like, to even, like, get into the, the scope of how and how difficult this is to actually get into is a huge subject. It is just huge to get into because to understand Brood War at that level is huge. And, you know, rebuilding it or adjusting it or whatever introduces so many questions that you have to account for that when I make these campaigns, it's like, I'm not, I'm thinking of it from a melee perspective in a sense that I want the gameplay to be melee-like, but I'm throwing out a lot of the core tenants that comprise melee. Things like the, you know, comparatively small tech trees, you know, very limited resources and upgrades. Um, you know, the 15 minute game length that Blizzard targets and stuff like that. Uh, obviously very different from Brood War where you can easily have up to like 45 uh, minute matches. But uh, Blizzard in StarCraft 2 wants that 15 minute and below game time. And uh, we turn around and say, no, we don't want that. We want, you know, Brood War paced introduction. I'm, I stuck to the four workers, 50 minerals for basically 90% of missions. Very, 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 very rarely did you have more than that. Because I felt that early game was really important. And even if we're looking at a large scale map that has, you know, potentially two hours of gameplay in it and a whole bunch of different enemies and all this other kind of stuff, I wanted you to be making critical decisions within the first 10 seconds of the game about where to start scouting, what to start building first, and stuff like that. And, you know, that meant that keeping that melee pace, keeping that melee presentation, but once we start entering the tech trees, unit design, stuff like that, then that's when we all start diverging quite a bit. And I do think that it probably would have taken a long time to really reach the balance that I felt positive about that, because anytime I change or add something, I go through a list of, like, what does this contribute to the game? What problem am I solving by adding this? What problems am I making by adding this? So on and so forth. And particularly for player-controlled stuff, it's very important to answer those questions before you even get to work on it. Well, that certainly makes sense to me, especially the idea that it takes a really long time to explain the whole concept of uh, even what you have to worry about or, or what risks you're taking when you try to make something that's like Brood War in that respect. So uh, that's why I more or less said, uh, you know, I wasn't going to press you too much on the tech tree stuff. It is an interesting point for me, and that's something that we could definitely get into in another podcast, because I feel like it's one of those things that, uh, you know, it's definitely possible to make something that uh, is more complex and more deep in terms of the number of units or the level of tiers that you can have in a, in a game, uh, while still maintaining support for a melee environment in that sense. And uh, we'll see w how Hydra works out in that re particular respect, because one of the things that I've constantly tried to do is maintain one-to-one -one parity with the uh, tech tree options in the campaign versus the tech tree options in the uh, melee game, so that you can instantly translate your knowledge from playing the campaign into playing multiplayer Hydra, should you want to do that. And that's something that I believe very strongly in, even if it's not something that uh, ends up working out in this particular case. I do think it's something that uh, can certainly be done, it doesn't mean that all you know future projects that use Hydra's game state would have to restrict all of their campaign tech to whatever was available in Melee. I'm sure there's going to be plenty of cases where I make you know stuff that piggybacks off of the game state uh, that uh, introduces new races or new units or whatever. I already have plans to do just that, actually. So it's more so for the introductory campaigns that really introduce you to the Hydra tech tree and force you to go up against some AI that really does mandate... Uh, cooperation with your ai allies or your player allies if they are uh, involved at all and uh, certainly requires that you play at a high level 
uh, sort of as an introducer, uh, something that uh, introduces you to the concept of, of playing an RTS custom project that does test your metal, do, does make you improve as a player if you want to get anything done. I think that's uh, really, it's something that people would be interested in, right? It's sort of, if you want to think of it in marketing terms, it's, it's a market that's yet untapped, but uh, regardless of how small it is or how niche it is, I think it's, it's a worthy experience to try to, to create in the first place. And so that's more or less what I'm targeting when I'm, I'm trying to do my thing is see what I can do because I, I'm personally just after something that I also enjoy playing on my own end, which I assume is also yep. something that you personally had to chase after as well as like, yeah. if this content isn't, isn't going to make itself right, that nobody else is making this content. Nobody else is even giving a shit. So might as well be, uh, you know, me. So at least I can count on myself to get the job done. Uh, that sort of approach. So, I think a lot of that is uh, still echoed in my own personal uh, design uh, philosophy is always uh, sort of hearkening back to what I think will be positive, what what I think will be enjoyable. And I guess that can be uh, some lessons to take from this podcast, actually, is the, the idea that, uh, you know, the, the whole uh, resource multiplier uh, thing that I was sort of fretting about and, and the whole inalienable advantages thing that I was fretting about. Obviously, I'm targeting a more multiplayer-focused environment where, in theory, the AI are supposed to be on somewhat even playing fields with the players. Uh, but even, you know, dismissing some of that, like you said, I think there is a distinction between stuff that is uh, not immediately apparent, that is uh, sort of there as a way to softly uh, silence the impact of the AI's stupidity when it comes to micro by just having them have more units or whatever um, mm -hmm. based on the increased multiplier that they get for money. Stuff like that, that where there is still counterplay, there is still a direct link between the number of production structures they have and the num number of units that are on the field, the number of expansions that they have and the number of units that are on the field. And uh, stuff that sort of softens the blow of, of just how dumb the AI actually is with precise unit control. And then as time goes on, you, know, you, you at least have a framework that you know works. You can tone down the number of uh, resources that they get per return with the multiplier as they get better uh, micro capabilities, assuming they do get better micro capabilities at all. So there's definitely a lot to go off of there just by itself. But um, perhaps that's uh, sort of hearkening back to our previous episode where we talked about uh, pulling the trigger, knowing when to pull the trigger on something. And in this particular case, it's like rather than fret about the, the resource multiplier, might as well just give it a shot, see what happens, see if it's a positive change, and uh, then you know feel free to walk it back at some point if it becomes too mm -hmm. overbearing in that particular respect. I think that's one lesson that we can take from it anyway. And uh, I'm sure there's plenty of other things. Like One of the things that I definitely think is interesting is the, the disparity between the two of our approaches where I've obviously gone for a much more like sort of by-the-book almost approach where I'm trying to keep things very, very consistent. And yeah, not to say that you were going gimmick crazy, but you were definitely uh, treating the missions as more of a an opportunity to explore like, i guess you were you were thinking a bit more aggressively about the story you were certainly positing like yeah. here's the story ramifications of what you're just you know the first mission where you're fighting back the attack force and now you know that's a, a sort of excuse or set up for the uh, the large amount of production that's just sitting there unsupervised waiting to be reactivated waiting to have enough resources to start fueling it um stuff like that is definitely uh not something that I would have immediately thought of myself because I'm thinking of trying to keep things in the melee framework, including starting units and uh, trying to work my way up from there. If there is going to be any working up at that point. And yeah. um, to the point where I would, I would probably even go as far as to in, in the case that I talked about with the Protoss mission, where you have a Protoss and a Zerg that have been duking it out for a while, I would probably simulate up to like three or four minutes in game of that AI personality, figure out what they had built most of the time um, and what the game state was like, what their map state was like after the fact, and then use that as like their starting forces to the point where like, again, trying to maintain as much of that sort of, uh, I guess you could call it realism. Like what, what would a real map play out like in the first couple of minutes, um, rather than just ask the question and try to come up with an answer on the spot or plan out an answer in a, a story-based sense, uh, just run, run a few tests, see what ha actually happens in a one V one between those two players on that map. And, uh, then see what they do after the fact and how that evolves from there. And that's probably one of the things that I'll end up doing for uh, the situations where I do end up having stuff like that. But of course, there's also the opportunity for me to take a more uh, Apex-like approach where I do have some some set-piece oriented stuff, some prescripted stuff that ends up happening um, before uh, the player really has a chance to, to get in and, and mess around with stuff. So uh, time will tell, I suppose, but definitely some interesting ideas, some interesting thoughts. I'm a... I got a lot to mull over after this one. I'll tell you that much. But 
I suppose the most important thing really at the end of the day is just that like we were just going over the idea that uh, the end result ends up being uh, fun for you as a developer. Because if it's not fun for you, it's, you're going to have a hard time convincing anybody else to try it. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if you have any sort of closing remarks or ideas or anything uh, to send us home with. Most the other stuff could just end up branching and do its own thing. So I think that's a pretty good place to start. Absolutely. So we definitely have a number number of different ways that we can go, a number of different branching paths. Choose your own adventure in the next big boys table. Will it be uh, tech trees? Will it be, you know, talking a bit more about core mechanics associated with an RTS and uh, whether or not you should even bother trying to reinvent the wheel in that particular respect? I think there is a, a larger conversation we can have about uh, trying to be the next brood war or, or whatever you would call that. Uh, certainly there's yeah. a bunch of different things that uh, come to mind when I think of that concept. Uh, because in a way, I'm, I'm basically reinventing the game with Hydra itself. Yeah. So, you know, there's uh, I, I have to, I do have to wonder if th- it wasn't necessarily my intention to ever replace 1v1, for example, because I do think Brood War has solved 1v1 in that particular respect. Not in the way that nothing else can be interesting, but it's not my goal to make a, a more compelling 1v1 uh, game mode uh, or game state that is more compelling as a 1v1 RTS experience than Brood War 1v1 is. I think instead I, I've been targeting team games, 2v2s, 3v3s, free-for-alls, uh, 4v4s, and trying to build maps around the idea that some maps are, some even the melee maps are a- asymmetrical, uh, and sometimes they're only symmetrical for like the first half of the map, like the the top half or something. So there, there's all sorts of different things that come up from there, and I'm sure we could talk about uh, map balancing and, and go a little bit more in depth into the uh, various sort of subtopics that we broached with this particular podcast. So yeah, thanks for joining me once again, and I guess that's another episode in the can, number fifty, halfway to a hundred which means uh, I guess we'll all be dead soon. Yeah. Well, Uh, it'll be in, uh, what was it, December 21st, 2012. (laughs) Yeah, my grandmother really believed in that shit. (laughs) Did she sell all her stuff? No, no, but she was constantly talking about how I'm going to hell and the world's going to end. and You know know how these people are. They just move the goalpost when it doesn't happen. Yeah, it's well, but even even she knows what's going up with the left right now. She's asking questions like, "Why is everyone going insane?" How embarrassing! It's uh, the wild times that we live in. She's constantly talking about how it's the end days, and uh, I guess India is having a little bit of a locust problem. And she's like, "It's in the Bible." <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, "Okay, they <laughs> they always have locust problems. That's why they call it locust." fucking bibble bibble so yeah the second coming chunkier than the first now it's both hands now double your chromosomes double your chins <laughs>